Welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke, and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. The videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Today we have two speakers. Neil Bryan is a naturalist at the Pioneers Park Nature Center. He directs the educational initiatives and programs which include nature day camp, school field trips, and natural history exhibits. Prior to joining the Nature Center, he worked and studied at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln for 14 years, last as Associate Director of Graduate Student and Postdoc Development. He also taught for 10 years and was a graduate teaching and career consultant and liaison. Neil has degrees in both botany and wildlife, but he prefers to study plants because they tend to stay where you put them. <laughs> Our other speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed was a historic preservation planner for the city of Lincoln uh, and county government from 1985 to 2020. Since retiring, Ed remains an active community historian and volunteer. Ed is native to Omaha, Nebraska, and has an undergraduate degree from Lindenwood College and a PhD from Boston University. Neil and Ed's talk today is titled, Celebrating 60 Years of Pioneers Park Nature Center and Looking Towards Pioneers Park Centennial. Please join me in welcoming Neil and Ed. Hello, my name's Neil, and here's Ed. And I study buildings because they sometimes stay in the same <laughs> That's place. true. Or they disappear completely. That's right. Same with plants, actually. They tend to stay in place, but they move around quite a bit, too. Um, as naturalist at Pioneers Park Nature Center, um, we recently celebrated, our, we're celebrating our 60th year, um, dedicated in May of 63. The Nature Center, um, because we're on a, a round year, um, I'll, I'll get to talk first. Um, talk a little bit about the, the highlights, a little bit of the context of the Nature Center and its development and its role in Lincoln throughout those 60 years. Um, and then Ed will fill in the gaps and put parentheses around that and provide a lot more context in history um, because when something has been around for 60 or 100 years, the stories that the stories and the connections with uh, people and places um, really become um, inextricable, and you can follow them down um, in many, many ways. Um, so, anything to add before we go? All right. So as I said, 1963, this photo that you see here is 1962 when they were scouting for a location to build the, the Redwood Shack. We'll talk about that in just a minute. This, ends up, this, uh, this photo is taken looking, south, looking southwest from the eventual site of the Chet Ager Nature Study Center. Um, overlooking pond number one is what it was named at the time. Does anyone remember it being called pond number one? <laughs> <laughs> this one is, is uh, on the maps today, it's called uh, wood duck pond, um, partly because the wood ducks um, nest just to the south there. All right, so again, I'm just going to touch the high points of the context here, uh, but if we go back to 18 or 1928, 1929, and 1930, um, it was a time of vision and opportunity for Pioneers Park. Um, the vision was provided by Ernst Terminghaus, a educated at University of Nebraska Lincoln, and then Harvard in landscape architecture, um, who developed this, uh, Ernst developed this design. This is a 1993 rendition, 
or a um, 1993 representation of that plan. The opportunity was provided in 1928 through 1930 through several gifts to the city of Lincoln by John Harris, who at the time was a New York City financier, and, but he grew up in the 1870s and 1880s as a boy in Lincoln. And in 1928, with his career mostly behind him, he ran into some friends, a friend by the name of Woods, that you'll be talking about, or? I'll talk more about Harris than Woods. Okay, Woods <laughs> of Woods Brothers Realty. Okay, um, they all knew each other. Um, he ran into his friend. Um, I think it was George. It was George, it was George, George Woods. Um, ran into him and remembered fondly his time in Lincoln. His parents, considered his parents pioneers, uh, coming to Lincoln in the late 1800s. And so he made a donation. The land was found by George and um, was purchased by John and then donated to the city of Lincoln in remembrance of his parents and all the other pioneers of Lincoln. Um, that land acquisition um, came from, it was at the time it was BNSF property, um, the Burnham Feed Yards, I believe it was. Um, and in total, it was the first, the first uh, donation was 500 acres. And then as they began construction and started filling the pond, he bought another 100 acres to the west because he wanted that pond was filling outside of the boundary, and so he bought another 100 acres. So eventually it was a 600 acre donation, and that was Pioneers Park in 1930. It dedicated in, dedicated in 1930, but I'm overlaying the 1930 handwritten plan the, the design uh, um, from Herminghouse's design. And so, again, just this detail, you can see how closely the landscape in 1993 and today matches Herminghouse's vision. Um, just a couple things. The golf course. They got started on that immediately, 1930. I think you could golf in 1931. Um, the bird sanctuary there, noted. Bird sanctuary is written at a 90 degree angle. Um, but it was not until 1963 that that became a, a dedicated bird sanctuary. Um, the, the wetlands, the ponds were dug early on. And there were some plantings that were made. Uh, this was overseen because it was a park, it was overseen by the city forester. Um, and so, as we'll talk about in a couple minutes, um, the area just to the north of where the Chet building was, was the city nursery. So we didn't, uh, well, I'm, I'm assuming you're gonna have some treeless photos. <laughs> um, because at the time, in 1930, there were no trees there. Um, I have, a photo that didn't make it into the final cut of this slide deck um, with some five-year-old trees scattered around and they're starting to um, starting preparations for the uh, 1935 dedication of the smoke signal statue. Let's zip ahead a little bit getting into the nature center proper. Um, in 1963, you can see Pioneers Park in that little polygon, shaded polygon on the bottom left, Southwest Lincoln. Um, you can see in 1963, a little bit of context here. Um, it's the nearest neighbor is the insane asylum in the reformatory and no subdivisions, unlike today. Uh, very few people lived within three or four miles of the park 
even in 1963. Up. You can see the Belmont neighborhood north of the brand new I-80 section, or just south, I'm sorry, just south of the I-80, brand new section. Um, the I-80, the, the I-180 spur was dedicated in 19, Paul sent 1962, and that's when the Belmont neighborhood began. Um, one other thing that's interesting is Holmes Lake, what is now known as Holmes Lake, is on the extreme south east border there of Lincoln. Um, so at, at the time, 150,000 people. So a little bit of orientation. You'll see later in the context of a larger map, but this nature center, the, um, first, let me take a step back. The nature center is, uh, is, is the land that is dedicated to a sanctuary and the study of nature. Um, it's not a building or a person or, um, or a specific place, but the, the boundary that surrounds the habitats and ecosystems. So at the time, Chet Ager Nature Center it, in its inception, inception was 40 acres. Um, just south of the Park Road, that's its current alignment. And there's, from left to right, we have pond three, pond two, and pond one. So that picture that I started with was taken from the wild garden looking southeast into the bridle path. Um, this is a 1963 or 1964 version of the map. So if the, if the Nature Center was dedicated in 63, you can see that they built a lot of trails and planted a lot of trees in one year unless there was a little bit of more development. And that was what I was talking about before. Um, because it was part of the park system, um, there was some trail development and the, and the nursery was north there in the Prairie Knoll what's what's, meant, uh, what's denoted there in the pra Prairie Knoll uh, um, between 1930 and 1963. In 1962, raise of hands, does anyone know that man by, you can raise your hand? No? <laughs> I'll give you a clue. He started Lincoln Community Foundation. Another clue? He was the newspaperman, owner, publisher of Lincoln Journal. So it'd have to be a Seacrest. It would have to be a Seacrest, Joe Seacrest. Joe Seacrest in 1962 visited Cornell's Sapsucker Woods and the observatory there. And when he came back, Lincoln just had to have that bird sanctuary that's been on the map for um, 30 years. So he wrote, he wrote Jim Ager Jim Ager being the current superintendent of parks uh, and Jim also was the son of Chet Ager. That's the family relation. Not um, Jim Ager has got the Ager golf course named after him. Chet Ager had the, uh, the nature center named after him originally. The building is still the original building there, see on the map on the north shore of Pond 2. Um, you heard me mention that it was a 1963 or 1964 map. Um, a second building was built in 1966. So one building and a windmill meant that it was a 1964 map. There's that single building, the original building built in December of 63. It was originally called, you heard me talk about it earlier, as the a Redwood Shack. Um, uh, in the, the uh, I have the original e uh, email, listen to me, I have the original uh, letterhead from Joe's desk typed out to Jim Ager, listen, we've got to get a nature center up before winter. Let's order a redwood shack and put up a fence. It's paraphrasing, of course. 
Um, that Redwood Shack was ordered, mail order, it was delivered on the back of a truck and put up in several, over several days in December of 1962. Uh, that windmill has an interesting history itself, uh, only to say that it was, it was built originally to help um, water trees in that area as they were moving into planting. Um, it was in use for about a day and a half before they realized it was pumping up salt water. So it was, it was an icon of the Nature Center for many years. In, in the 90s, they had engineering students that came out and tried to retrofit it to generate electricity. And eventually, it no longer, it no longer stands, although you still can find the standpipe. They didn't remove that. So just north, just north of the original building, still in place, um, you can see the old standpipe. So May 21st, 1963, they dedicated that Redwood Shack and the 40 acres around it. Um, it was Joe Seacrest who suggested that they name it after Chet Ager. Um, Chet Ager, if you're not familiar, um, he was the superintendent of parks in Lincoln from 1933 to 1940 and did a lot of development of Pioneers Park in particular. Um, and a lot to do with the zoos as well. He was an avid outdoorsman and a wildlife enthusiast um, and was about conservation. He had a strong interest in conservation and, um, and sport. Uh, in, unfortunately, in many ways, uh, that enthusiasm for wildlife uh, led to his death in 1940. Um, but he, uh, I don't know, you, you weren't going to talk about that, were you? No. His ultimate no. demise? No, no. It was an accident. It was an accident with the wildlife, uh, with, a, with a large species of wildlife that eventually, uh, that led to him having a heart attack. So he died in office in 1930, uh, 1940, sorry. Um, and it was a, a loss to Lincoln. Um, but 23 years later, his son, Jim is there on the right, looking on as his mother, Beth, receives a plaque of dedication from um, former mayor and current councilman, D. Tyrell, and the fellow on the left is <coughs> Mayor Dean Peterson. As an aside, the next year, Dean Peterson would buy a house at 2236 South 9th Street. That becomes important later. <laughs> All right. So the, um, it was the park. The city natural, or it's not the city naturalist, the city forester was in charge of the site until Ann Lane was, was appointed as first naturalist of the Nature Center. You can see the, the ghostly building behind her. She goes bird watching. Um, she was, a fa she was a, the wife of a UNL faculty member, biochemistry, Charles Lane. Um, but she also was highly educated and with doctorate work. Um, I think it was at University of Loyola, Chicago. And she was appointed to um, administer and plan out and, um, and inventory what the, the Nature Center had and what it would in the future. She worked closely with um, scientists at the University of Nebraska, in particular um, Paul Johnsgaard and um, um, other names, the other main player. Um, but the plant science, plant science department as well. Some of you I heard talking about as we came in, you're talking about Esther Bennett. Esther Bennett, in, in 1966, Charles Lang left the university and his wife Anne, his wife Anne followed him. Um, in 60, April of 66, Esther Bennett, who was at the University of Nebraska at the time, um, P. 
PhD, very brilliant and able woman, was appointed as the next naturalist in 66. And she really took what um, Anne had established as far as education and facilities and brought it to the people. Um, in the in the original in the original plan, um, Anne was there pretty much part time. the 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 land was only open on Saturday and Sunday mornings. And you'd drive up to the gate, meet Anne, and go on a tour with her. Um, under Esther, the land became much more open. It became a destination to go um, throughout the week. Um, school tours began to be scheduled more and more. Exhibit space was expanded. Uh, the second building was built um, under Esther. Um, and really the, uh, it became even more and more a, a place of, for the community. Didn't have a parking lot until the year 2000, actually. So it was all along the park road. All right. Um, in the, the 70s and 80s, um, es Esther was the naturalist at the Nature Center for 10 years. And then she moved to the park's administration. And she was there for another 10 years. Um, in her time, um, even as naturalist, she advocated for adding more land to the Nature Center. Um, we have a letter from her citing scientific evidence that 40 acres is simply not enough, that it was the absolute minimum for a, for a Nature Center, and also that she did not like having uh, hunters sit on the south bank of Haynes Branch Creek and shoot birds as they flew left the Nature Center. So. 16, in 1975, 16 acres that was city-owned land, um, previously farmed of alfalfa, I think it was, um, was, that land was added and a swinging bridge was built, 1975. That was, that's the original swinging bridge. The one that exists now was uh, replaced this one in 1993. Um, also in uh, under Esther, uh, it was at the same time, well, while she was the naturalist, uh, many of you will remember Lincoln used to have three, or depending on how you counted, three or four park, or three or four zoos. There's the Antelope Park Zoo, the Lincoln Children's Zoo, um, which is Folsom Zoo as well, and then Pioneers Park Zoo. Um, this was mostly uh, the Pioneers Park Zoo was a pet project of Chet Ager. Um, at the time, it was mostly, it was kind of a wildlife safari experience, the current wildlife safari. But even then, um, as we're looking in that photo, looking up over that hill in the distance, that was the camel pen. And uh, zebras and zebus also lived there on the hill. Uh, so in 1983, 84, and 85, a lot was, we had consultants come into Lincoln. They decided to consolidate into one zoo. They decommissioned Antelope, decommissioned Antelope Zoo, Antelope Park Zoo, and Pioneers Park Zoo. And in 1985, that 80 acres that was Pioneers Park Zoo was added to the Nature Center. And that's when it crossed the, the north, it crossed over to the north side of the park road there. That's also when, um, the, um, well, you'll be able to see it more clearly in another map coming up. All right, here we go. You see the, the squiggly area. Um, you, you recognize pond one, pond three, pond two, and pond one at the bottom right. Uh, the pink area beneath it 
I don't know if I can point or not. Nope, I can't. The pink area beneath it was 16 acres added in 75, um, followed by various parcels. Um, the, late, the last one being in 2005, top left, 230 acres, uh, now called Foundation Prairie. Uh, local landowners either donated or um, offered to sell for the to the city. This was important, first of all, um, because it had been so fragmented. Um, we understand here, in this in this place, the importance of preservation, and the ecosystem in the habitats of a prairie and uh, the plants and animals that lived in it had not been preserved. And so being able to piecemeal, but nevertheless reconstruct and reconnect different uh, parcels of land and reunite them um, can't be understated. Um, the The park at, in 2005 with that last addition of 230 acres now is about two square miles, about 12, 1,200, 1,300 acres. The nature center itself is now today 668 acres. Um, but in this larger watershed, it's still a very small portion. Um, with Pioneers Park being two square miles, it's watershed that it sits in. Uh, is 69 square miles. So, not that Pioneers Park will ever be that large, but that expanding and understanding how it is part of a landscape is critical for its success. Most of the activity still is in a circle about 40 acres, interestingly. Um, and so, part of our uh, Emphasis now is to um, educate the public on how much nature is at the nature center. Um, there are several developed trails to the south and to the northwest that are stunningly beautiful, especially in the fall. We've had some rain lately. You should come out and take a look. It's great. So just as a, it helps to have it all in one side by side, 1930, this was a boundary 600 acres. In 63, still had that 600 acres. But in 2005 and after, we've added another Pioneers Park to it. It's doubled in size, and that left-hand half is the Nature Center of Pioneers Park. So today we're maintaining that and refining the use. We use it for many uses. We have um, at the bottom left several gardens around the Chet Ager building. Um, the, in the center is the Thomas Hudson cabin, originally found at 2236 South 9th Street in Lincoln. It was built by Thomas Hudson on a, on a um, quarter section of land that he got from the Homestead Act, uh, under the Homestead Act, um, and moved to several places, but eventually landed here on the edge of the prairie in Pioneers Park in 2010. We also have the Cunningham Schoolhouse, um, which was originally used as a one-room schoolhouse until the 60s, um, just north of Valparaiso. Um, it, it, it moved to its place here in 2009. North of the, north of the prairie building, north of the prairie center building, um, is a restored prairie, and work continues to restore the other areas, other land acquisitions that have um, been added to the nature center over time. 
in uh, will also be adding to the bison herd this fall. We have been trying, I was speaking with Bob earlier, and we've been trying for some time to add to the herd. Um, as, as animals, they tend to move around, and uh, it would be, and it's one of our, prior, one of our priorities to have that um, icon of the prairie more visible at the Nature Center. Um, also, we've got a little bit of a gem a, a newest building on the Nature Center is built in 2020, and it's uh, the Lynn Johnson Nature Education Building that we use for, as a headquarters for all of our education um, outreach and field trips for school children of the region and for uh, summer camps that the Nature Center through uh, Lincoln Parks and Rec provides to the city. So that's a quick overview with an emphasis on the Nature Center and how it has grown over time. Um, but there's so much more yet to be said in this hour, but um, so much more that we could say. I hope that um, you do, um, that you do spend some time at the Nature Center sometime soon. Um, and walk the trails that Ann Lane set up and visit the bison that have several generations have lived there now um, and just uh, love the place. Um, I'll just leave you this with uh, a before and after photo in 1960. You can, this is a 1965 or 1966 photo rather because you can see that second building behind. Um, but uh, same alignment on the opposite side of pond number two. Um, there's so much more to explore at the Nature Center even today. Okay. Now for a little broader context in both time and place. only because you had about a half an hour of material. We do an hour program. That's right. So I will see if I can do the rest time-wise. And I begin back um, pre-Pioneers Park um, with George Harris, the father of, of this clan. Uh, George was an abolitionist, a man who grew up in Massachusetts. Um, he had worked for Burlington Railroad for many years and was kind of colonizing abolitionists across the Midwest, which eventually brought him post-Civil War to Lincoln in 1874 um, with his wife Sarah and six or eight, seven children that lost an eighth um, as an infant. And they settled in Lincoln. Um, brand new city, uh, it's in its first decade, and he dies two years later. The expectation was that Sarah would move back somewhere, but her young adult family wanted to stay. And she continues then to raise her family in Lincoln um, till her death at 90. Her sons, two of them particularly, are very successful nationally in business, and they gift her about 1902 with a new house on the site of the old house. They lived just kitty corner from the Capitol grounds on the site of First Christian Church and they built for her in about 1902. Um, James Craddock was the architect for them. Um, this big early 20th century um, kind of American four square writ very large. Um, maybe using some elements of the 1870s house, probably not or at least not in anything we can see. The house gets moved in the 1930s, a couple lots to the east to clear the site for the church. And like any big house, downtown was used as fraternity for a while, um, but now is a, a city landmark, National Register property. And this is 
widow, Sarah's house, um, in the story. Uh, she dies in 1912, um, and she and George are buried at Wayuga Cemetery. Another fine design landscape, but not the one we're talking about. Enter in the second decade of the 20th century, Ernst Storming House, who you've introduced. Uh, his Cornhusker yearbook photo with his little monocle, uh, just um, to a picture I can't ever pass up presenting. Um, 1913 graduates from UNL, goes for two years to Harvard, and comes back with his uh, first tr academically trained landscape architect from Nebraska, uh, and has impact then uh, through much of the 20th century, and still has impact today. Some of his impact is going to tie back into Pioneers Park. Um, one of his first projects in Lincoln is a formal entrance to Antelope Park, which we might think of as being somewhere down south of Normal Boulevard. This was at O Street. Antelope Park came all the way up to O, and at the bottom of this view uh, would have been O Street at about 23rd. And he comes up with this very formal plan for a grand entrance to this park that's going to continue down along Antelope Creek for a couple miles. But this is one of his very first projects in Lincoln, and it gets built. Uh, this is the O Street entrance to Antelope Park, a couple, four grand columns, a curving fence, um, lamps, you know, just a very beautiful formal entrance. Um, and particularly, we see these. Um, antique columns, fluted, stacked up in drums. They're not the big monoliths that would be um, created later, but these are um, a Virginia sandstone column, and we'll get to them when they become relevant to Antelope Park, or to Piners Park. Herminghaus also designs um, some subdivisions. He's one of the uh, landscape architects for Harvey Rathbone for Sheridan Park, that's South Street at the top, Van Dorn at the bottom, 27th on the left, the west, 31st on the right. Um, and so that heart of Sheridan Boulevard with the big medians and curving Bradfield, um, Mance and Stratford tracing the boulevard is Herminghouse's early, early work. As brilliant young man come back to town and um, getting these big projects. And then a project that particularly relates to his frame of mind uh, and what he's thinking as he uh, encounters Pioneer's Park project is Woodshire. Uh, Woods Brothers project um, framed by High on the north, what they call Ponca on this map, we call it Calvert on the south, uh, 17th on the west, and no street on the right, but it's going to become 20th Street it edged up against the country club originally in this pattern of little diagonal streets coming in and then little circles at each traffic intersection. Particularly important in the design is there was a, a little bit of rough ground, a little ravine to the west side of the plan and that larger circle and the undeveloped land created or Herming House envisioned it as a view down to the state capitol uh, in his drawing for what a bird from the south would see looking across Woodshire up to the state capitol to the north. And remember, this is 1925. It's not there. The capitol's not there yet. Um, Herminghouse is very interested in the capitol then under construction, but he's not looking at a tower uh, rising up quite yet, except in his mind's eye, and it's a key part of his vision for this subdivision. Here's an early view of Woodshire. This is from the east, so we're looking across it, and that parkland um, is towards the top of the view. And here, uh, Woodshire is on the center right. We're looking north, and so right up here is the view across that parkland. Now, things happen over time, like trees, and they get much bigger, and it's only occasionally you can glimpse the top of the tower when the leaves are off the trees uh, across Woodshire Park. But it's part of Herminghouse's key vision for that subdivision. Now, bringing it back um, to the project at hand, these are the two brothers, John Harris on the right, uh, is the essential one who buys and donates the land to the city, but his brother George on the left was 
president of Burlington Railroad in his lifespan. Um, he has died in the teens. Uh, John lived on uh, 1941. But this family from uh, Father George to Son George, um, John is a New York City banker, but they have deep Burlington connections um, through the generations. Um, and they acquire this Burlington pasture land, I think it was resting and watering land for, you know, the tracks go right by, they're hauling train loads of livestock, we gotta let them, let them out now and then. And that's essentially the purpose of this rolling prairie south of Lincoln, which John acquires and in 28 on Christmas day, I believe it was, he donates to the city 500 acres of land, which becomes 600, which becomes 1200 eventually. Uh, here's a newspaper version of Herminghouse's drawing. Apparently there were three um, submissions to the city of a plan for this big gift and Herminghouse chaired the committee that reviewed the plans and accepted none of them. Um, not the first time that had ever <laughs> happened um, and he had been deeply invested in local landscape architecture business and um, receives the commission to lay out um, the plan that presumably incorporated or reportedly incorporated elements and thoughts of the other three submissions, but they didn't uh, pass muster uh, to be the master plan. The connection to the capital is obvious in the plan in many ways, including his title block. He, um, labels his comprehensive plan for a park of where 560 acres came from, unless there was some moment in there that they were thinking they'd get 60 more rather than 100 more. But in August 1928, he, he labels it um, his comprehensive plan and scrawls it across the Goodhue, Lee Lowry uh, bison from the north entrance to the Capitol. Um, so they're, you can hardly, well, you could be more explicit, and I'll get more explicit. Um, on his, this is a tattered blueprint of, or a black line um, of that plan. Uh, and if we look to the east portion, the east 80 acres, we call it, above the uh, bison. And here I've blotted out all of the edge. This is the original um, acreage. He's labeled one of the uh, vistas, and you have to imagine this is this is open prairie. You would see the Capitol Tower once it goes up from everywhere, uh, or any high point. It's by planting these view sheds, what we call LAs, that he narrows the view. He's not expanding the view, he's narrowing it down, so you focus and I can look to the back of the room and see Eileen if I stare right at her, even though I can see all of you, um, if I don't have trees planted. So, good hue capital is labeled and two of these, these view sheds, these, these framed LAs, point from the park and high points out to the Capitol. Um, and he puts right on it, good hue capital. In the um, original display of the Capitol designs in 1920, when the selection committee for the state Capitol had sat down and uh, identified that good hue would be the architect, not they had carefully specified they weren't choosing exactly the design in front of them, they were choosing the architect for the project. Uh, one of the sources, or one of the prominent figures in the design community uh, listed in the newspaper was Herminghaus. And he says, this design is high above all the others. He's one of the leading architects in the country. And what he's giving us is the equivalent of a cathedral tower, and that every community should have its cathedral or its distinguished skyscraper, and we'll have one. And that's, that's what this design gives us. And then he, in several of his designs, is making sure you know what to look at. Now, this is a more refined version um, in the mid-30s, but very closely um, based on his original. He doesn't put two ball fields there under the compass rows as he had on his original plan. And further west, he had lots of big ideas that um, could not be funded in the construction of the park in the midst of the depression. But that very elaborate entrance sequence uh, from the east entrance with the 
it's labeled Harris Circle, but most people would call Buffalo Circle, uh, is clearly there and the uh, radiating uh, roadways off of it and the axes for the views. And a more, th this is out of the National Register nomination of 1993 uh, of features in the park. That's also at the moment when many of the, the first plantings die out in the drought and are replanted throughout the 30s. And then there's a big die off in the um, 80s when many of the Austrian pines that have been planted um, start aging out and getting blight all at once. And it wasn't the purpose of the National Register nomination to guide, to set that those would come back, but I think the whole effort for reforestation was looking closely at Herminghouse's plans and trying to reestablish. And in fact, in some ways, getting closer to the original design intent, because planting it all in one species was not the original intent, that's what the money and the pricing could afford in the 30s and putting back conifers where there were conifers but with a broader uh, palette of, of types was going to create a more sustainable uh, environment that wasn't going to all die off at once 40 years later. They'll die. It's prairie. <laughs> but um, it, it is closer to Herminghouse's original thought. One of his planting schemes um, in a, a little arboretum corner wanted to plant kudzu, and I don't think he actually got that accomplished, um, but it was one on the long list of plant materials he was going to use. It's prairie, um, it's sparse, and it's drought as they get started. This is one of those early views. 1941 aerial photo. Uh, we can see some areas that, that we can start to identify uh, plants, but much of it is still pretty open uh, a decade after uh, the first planning, the golf course is in place in the upper left, uh, and the east 80 acres concepts are all <laughs> clearly there, um, but a lot of growth still to happen. That's Yankee Hill Brickyard uh, down below the east 80 acres. There's no north entrance. Hmm? There's no north and entrance no, to the Vanderbilt. Yeah, and no north entrance yet, or the, the land I think had been acquired, but it wasn't, no, it wasn't even acquired yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, more modern aerial view, uh, but this one we're looking from the east, but we can see we're creating those views by, by addition, not by subtraction. I like being out there and thinking, oh, we've cut down sections of the great conifer forest south of Lincoln to create those views, but that's not how it happened. This is how it happened, and it's that planting and framing. Um, that capital is really just, just a little thumb out on the horizon until you frame it in and then it's 400 feet tall and, and your eyes zoom in like telephoto lens. Early view, uh, mid 30s, I think yeah, this is 33 uh, on the date plot. So these are gonna be planted and die and planted again a couple times. Um, but you need the labor, you need the work, you need uh, everybody's hungry and the park not only gets, uh, is contributing to recreational opportunity but also to employment opportunity in the community. Um, now back in to look not broadly but some of the individual features. Um, the bison theme was strong not only to Herming House but to the Harrises and they commissioned George God, um, Gaudet, a French wildlife sculptor um, to do an American bison and they plant that at the east entrance. I like this 1936 view because we see the struggle to get things growing and how much grass, which is in a little bit of contrast to the postcard artists. Um, when you've got green watercolor, you can make grass grow. Um, yeah. All the plants are the same, but, but the, um, it didn't quite look like this, probably except on the rainiest uh, week of summer. And the bison is there now in a nice green lawn uh, without some of the greater elaboration of the original boxwood hedges and such around it. Um, and one of those key vistas is the, vi the bison's vista down to the tower. Uh, it lines right up to the, the east entrance and now with Bison Trail, continuing that vista across the adjacent land, it even strengthens that particular view uh, that Herminghouse had intended. 
lots of other WPA evidence or work relief evidence of the various alphabet agencies of the New Deal uh, are still uh, there in the park. A um, masonry picnic shelter in the picnic area probably dates back to 1930. Uh, it's one of the more dressed masonry projects in the, in the park. This isn't rubble stone like many of the service buildings, uh, utility building, probably using uh, salvage material maybe from some of the alleys in Haymarket where there were stone pavements. There's one stone alley left in Haymarket and the whole variety of stone used here probably includes some of those pavers. Uh, but this building's still in use and in, in its original or equivalent use today near the picnic area. Uh, as was mentioned, the golf course goes in very early. It seems a little ironic at the um, beginning of the Depression that golf will be the first thing you put in, but they, they put in like 18 sand greens first, and then they're up to 27 for a brief period um, in 33, 34. They move equipment from the Antelope Park golf course, including the furnace um, and some plumbing fixtures from um, the clubhouse there out to Pioneers Park uh, when they build the clubhouse in 39. Fritz Craig, the Lincoln architect, was the designer and the stone came from the park department's own quarry um, in Roca. This maybe was the last building, Chet Eager building, uh, now on the uh, children's zoo grounds, um, was also quarried at Roca. But I think these pretty much exhausted the buildable stone out of the quarry. I think gravel may still come from there, but uh, not building stone. But this nice uh, clubhouse building is still there um, at the golf course which has quite a spectacular view. Lots of features in the, th the Hermminghaus original scheme don't happen. The summer cottages, the swimming pool, uh, the formal mall. But if you can see above the portion labeled auto parking, there's sort of a shell design. It's labeled Greek theater just below the zoo. Um, there was also labeled on the plan Red Cloud, which was to be um, by the original plan somewhere near the top of the sled hill. Um, but a site is selected further west, looking towards the picnic grounds. Uh, and in 35, the Red Cloud statue, 15 foot tall depiction of Red Cloud signaling um, with a little um, campfire in front of it and a blanket to, to signal send so smoke signals and the choice is to have him facing west, not east towards the city, but west towards what now is, is a much bigger natural prairie um, in the distance. Still there today, this is the work of Ellis Berman, a sculptor who contributed four sculptures in mid-30s to the Lincoln Parks. Uh, now painted sort of in a bronze color, but this is cast concrete, uh, but well-maintained. Berman's, three of the four Berman statues still are in the parks. Uh, the Victory or Four Wars Memorial uh, near the Bandshell in Antelope Park with um, figures around the base from the Revolution, Civil War, Spanish-American War, and the World War, which you could call it in 1935 because we didn't have to number them yet. Um, but, uh, and below each uh, military figure, um, a warship of its day and Berman gets his name on the plaque. And also the Pioneer Woman, uh, further south on Pioneers Park, almost to Sheridan, had a gazebo behind it originally, and a new one's been built, and I have to go back and get a better view when all the plants are in. But Pioneer Woman still stands. This donated by the Lincoln Women's Club, but Berman's work. And there had been a Rebecca at the Well in the pool at the base of the little waterfall uh, in um, Sunken Garden. And she survived until the rebuild uh, a few years ago. But putting a cast concrete statue in a pond uh, is not good for its longevity and couldn't be restored. And instead, uh, in the uh, rebuilding of, Pine of Sunken Garden, a bronze Rebecca at the well, not by Ellis Berman, uh, recalls the fourth Berman statue. And that scallop shell becomes Pinewood Bowl, 
under Herminghouse's direction in 47, uh, post-World War II, um, on a little natural amphitheater space and then backed up with, with plantings to create a greater sense of enclosure. And that's our Pinewood Bowl today, um, where the summer musicals and some bigger names. Um, and I believe this month there are to be 11 concerts at Pinewood and the arena. Um, Paul Simon and Bonnie Raitt and Willie Nelson and many others who I don't recognize um, have played Pinewood in recent years. Dedicated to the World War II veterans. And it's when Pinewood's under construction that Seacrest and others give a north entrance to the park to create a better circulation pattern for bigger events at the bowl. Um, a strip of land a quarter mile wide, or a quarter mile long, and 144 feet wide. So it's basically a wide right of way down in from the north entrance. Um, also at Pinewood, to tie it to other places, some of the fence work, this column may look familiar from Wayuka, uh, where the O Street fence, which is formerly the UNL fence, um, all have the mark John Seton, Natchez, and Kansas, and those posts do as well. Not still in the park, but a uh, a relic that was there for a time. Locomotive 910 was a Burlington locomotive uh, given in the 50s. 910 was its later designation when it was um, retooled a couple times. It was built at Havelock in 1901, given to the city under its original uh, name, 710, and put in a little fence enclosure. I think of this as a locomotive zoo um, at the park. Never got a chance to go down the sled hill, not fair at all, but it was, picked, it was there in the mid-50s and there until the late 80s when it was picked up, refurbished in Iowa and brought back to Lincoln Station where I think it's much more congenial um, in its placement. And then a couple last details, that entrance from the um, north edge of Antelope Park that those columns had come from the Treasury Building in Washington, D.C., 1830s, 1840s construction by Robert Mills, grand colonnade, built not in the granite that would have been a little bit later, but those sandstone columns uh, were weathering poorly and were miscolored. They were kind of brown, various shades of brown. And in the first decade of the 20th century, they were replaced with granite monoliths. All that whole row of columns, lots of ideas came up about what to do with the old ones. Uh, none of them came to fruition. Most of them were dynamited into, back into gravel. But four of them were acquired um, and given to the city of Lincoln in honor of William Jennings Bryan. And this is the Treasury Building colonnade now in granite. This is where they appeared in Lincoln under Herminghouse design. This is the successor to the Safeway store that became, um, and it's the same building, that's the Safeway store building, came Office Max, and then uh, now restoring the more um, graceful design of the Safeway as um, Health 360. This is the old site of the columns, 1975. 576 as a bicentennial project. They're moved out to Pioneers Park, right nicely placed in one of those alleys, and we have the columns. Still Robert Mills, 19, 1830, 1840 work in Washington and in Lincoln, Nebraska. So when you write about that famous building and publish a book on it, you have to have photos from Pioneers Park. And that brings us you covered the last steps of the cabin and the schoolhouse, and I think we're, we're back to almost 100 years of Pioneers Park and 60 years of the Nature Center, and it's one o'clock.